Well, uh, good morning. So good to have you here this morning. If I don't know you, uh, my name is Brian. I am the lead pastor uh, here at Grace City, and so it's great um, to have you in the room. So thanks for packing in here. Uh, it, um, it, as we progressively get closer to the fall, everyone's rhythms get back to normal, it'll get uh, a bit chaotic. And so if you have an extra, I don't know, five to 10,000 square feet laying around in the city of Boston, I would love to chat with you about that. Um, in, uh, in the city would be great. And so thanks, thanks so much for, um, for being here. We're grateful uh, to have you. We're uh, on the back end of a series uh, walking through the book of Psalms. And so what, what we've been saying um, is the book of Psalms, uh, out of kind of all of the scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, is probably one that you're familiar with. Uh, even if you're not really familiar with the Bible, um, you've probably heard a psalm before, uh, perhaps put uh, to a song or maybe at a funeral or at a wedding. It's just there, there's something about the Psalms that tend to resonate deeply with uh, humanity. So whether they, uh, whether you have a, a kind of a church background or not, um, there, there's something about them uh, that resonates. And, and really what we've been saying is that if, if you dive in uh, to the Psalms enough, what you'll find is that whatever kind of season that you're walking in, there, there's most likely going to be a Psalm that's going to match that season. And so if you're going through uh, a season where everything's going great, right, which is a season that all of us want to be going through all the time, uh, there, there will be a psalm that, that would, would match that type of gladness, the gratefulness that you feel. If you're going through a season of, of difficulty and, and trial, there is a, a psalm that will be able to, to match that. If, there, if you're going through a season of confusion, there is a psalm that you can find to, to match that. If you're in need, there's a psalm um, that, that will match that. There, it just the, the psalms have a really wonderful way of kind of connecting at a very deep level. And, and we've said that the, 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 really the two gifts that we get from the Psalms, the reason why we should read them in the first place, um, is that the first one is the Psalms give us a correct picture of God. And so we left our own devices, we've talked about it, but left our own devices, we create a God who's way more manageable, we create a God who we understand, we create a God who has the same emotional, I was gonna say balance, but we could say imbalance uh, that we have, right? Uh, we, we will create a God that is, is a God in our image, right? Instead of us being made in the image of God, we make him into our image. And so left our own devices, that's what we tend to do. And so the book of Psalms gives us a, a real clear picture of, okay, this is, this is the God of the Bible. And then the second thing that the Psalms do, and this will, this will touch in particular for what we're looking at this morning, is the Psalms give us a picture of what life is actually like, um, the reality of life. And, and sometimes I've found what happens in Christian circles uh, or in kind of church world, sometimes in our zeal to get people to say yes to Jesus, to get people to walk into Christian faith, to get people to walk into the way of Jesus, some, sometimes we talk about faith and we talk about our relationship, um, again, rooted in a really good place, um, rooted in kind of a zeal to, to really have people embrace the way of Jesus. Sometimes we can paint the picture of Christianity uh, a lot brighter than it than it is at times, and I, I, let me be very clear. Right, I'm a pastor, so you should remove me if I didn't believe this. I believe life with Jesus is good, right? And I believe it's the right way. And I believe that um, when you say yes to Jesus, like it 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 changes you for the the better. Like it it is a um, a way to flourish that you would not flourish otherwise. Like life with Jesus brings about human flourishing. That's true. Uh, but there can also be a tendency when we're talking about the way of Jesus and the Christian faith that in our zeal, we just make it sound like everything's really great all the time. And it's just not true. Um, it's just not true. And, and the longer that you live, the more that you kind of realize that you're walking with God, the more that you realize you're like, man, this is not all lining up the way that I thought it would. And I actually have a tremendous amount of confusion uh, I, I'm, I'm actually struggling here with some anxiety and some difficulty, and I've got grief, and I've got loss, and I've got uncertainty, and, and if you're not prepared for that, right, and, and you've, you're following Jesus, and you've said yes to him, and you've given your life over to him, and you're committed to being in a community of other believers, if you're not ready for that, it can be very disorienting. And so this morning, what we want to look at is this idea of, or, or this practice of lament, 
Um, so, so the last few weeks, we've looked at a psalm that, that talks about thanksgiving, right? And so we, we can respond with gratitude towards God for the good gifts that he gives us, right? And so when we feel blessed, when we feel goodness in our life, the, the, the response out of that is gratitude and thankfulness towards God. And so the question becomes, what happens when we don't feel that way? Uh, when we feel uncertain, when we feel lost, when we feel grief, when we feel confusion, What's the answer then? And, and biblically, the answer is this concept of lament. Now, lament is not something we do well. We're, we're not built in our cultural moment for lament. So none of us, are, none of us have probably ever just out of our mind just said, I'm just, you know, t- tell me how you're doing. Like, tell me how's your week going, how's your you know, month going, whatever, whatever. Probably nobody in the room is going, well, I'm just I'm in a season of lamenting. Like that's not, that's just not who, this is just not who we are. We're not, our cultural moment hasn't formed us and shaped us in a way to embrace lamenting. And, and, and the issue is um, that in the Bible um, and uh, through God's people, the Israelites, uh, they actually embrace and do lamenting really well. And, and, and it's probably the most, the, the, probably the least understood kind of Christian practice is, is lamenting, but it's also one that's very, 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 very important. And I don't believe spiritual maturity and spiritual form, healthy spiritual formation happens without understanding how to practice lament. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about um, what that looks like uh, this morning, this idea of, of biblical uh, lamenting. And so uh, it will be tough. Uh, this is not, you know, this is not a certain, this, this is it's a taxing kind of thing. Uh, to talk through, but, but hopefully it'll kind of lead us um, to, to a healthy place. But, but I want to look at um, the Israelites' kind of process of, of lamenting and, and understanding what that looks like. They, they actually have a whole book called uh, Lamentations. I, I'm not going to read it all. None of us want to get into a study of Lamentations because uh, it just would not, no one wants to do that. But I'm going to read the first part of it because it kind of sets up. Again, they have a whole book meant to to practice lamenting, but this is just uh, 1 verse 1, chapter 1 verse 1. Uh, it says, how she, now she is Jerusalem. This is their, their city, right? This is their capital. This is um, God's promised city to them. It says, how, how she sits alone. They're talking about the destruction of, of Jerusalem, the isolation of Jerusalem. It says, um, how she sits alone, the city once crowded with people. She who is great among the nations has become like a, a widow. Uh, the princess among the provinces has been put to force labor. So again, uh, Lamentations 1.1. They're going, look at Jerusalem. This is Israelites. They're going, look at Jerusalem. Like this great, once great city uh, is now no longer great. This this city was once filled with people. is no longer filled with people. It's actually the, 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 the city that was at the top is now finding itself at the bottom in forced labor. The whole book. Uh, King David, uh, when, when King Saul died and his son Jonathan, so uh, Saul in the Old Testament, um, Saul was the first king of Israel, and his son was Jonathan, and, and it, it, the way the progress kind of happens is Saul ends up wanting to kill David because David is going to be the future uh, king, uh, but David's also best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, right? So you can imagine the dynamics of this particular relational situation. Uh, but Saul and, and Jonathan both die, and, and we get a lament from King David in Second Samuel 1, 23 and 27. Look how David responds. It says, Saul and Jonathan loved and delightful. They were not parted in life or in death. So that, recognizing they died together. They were swifter than eagles and stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things and decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Your love for me was more wondrous than the love of a woman. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. Okay, so, so David, again, uh, King Saul was trying to kill him, and now his best friend Jonathan, and, and King David's response in this moment is to lament, is to, to, to write it out, um, to, to put it to song, to put poetry to the words that he's feeling. Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3, uh, 1 through 4, this will sound familiar because there's a song, right, 
for every season turn turn okay here we go um Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. Is that the birds? Is that, is that saying that right? Anyway? Okay, you're all young. Birds is a band that exists. Okay, anyways, all right. Um, there, uh, this is what Solomon says. There's an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal. Uh, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Solomon's going, okay, there's a time. Um, for every season, turn, 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 right? There is a, there is, uh, a moment to, to weep. There's a moment to mourn loss. Uh, there's, there's a season. We have different seasons that we are in. Psalm 130, 1 through 2. It says, out of the depths, listen to this lament. It says, out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, listen to my voice and let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Psalm 6, verse 4. Turn, Lord, rescue me, save me because of your faithful love. See, the, the, the Israelites and the, the authors of the, the Old Testament, they, they embrace l- lamenting, not as this little kind of side thing, but this formative practice for life with God. One, um, one biblical commentator says it this way. It says that the, the, the predominance of laments at the very heart of Israel's prayers means that the problems that give rise to lament are not something marginal or unusual, but rather are central to the life of faith. Moreover, they show that the experience of anguish and puzzlement in the life of faith is not a sign of deficient faith, something to be outgrown or put behind one, but rather intrinsic to the very nature of faith. That if you want to grow in health with God, in relationship, in, in following the way of Jesus, lamenting isn't actually just something that you're like, oh man, maybe I'll get to at some point if I need to. It actually becomes central to the foundation of who you are in your Christian discipleship. But to be able to experience grief around you, sadness around you, and, and loss around you and and to be able to honestly deal with it this is this is what it means to lament lament is lament um at its essence is actually protest right and and so kind of everything um so over the last few years we've kind of seen this the move like the movement we've seen within black lives matter um that's lament that's protest that's what it means to acknowledge and recognize right and to respond, this is, this is what it means to lament. So, so how do we do this? How do we do this well? Um, how do we do this in a way that, 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 that honors God? And so I want to kind of walk th- uh, a bit through this um, kind of four-step uh, process um, on, on how to do this. There, there's an author who wrote a book called Weep With Me, How Lament Opens a Door uh, for Racial Reconciliation. He, so he was specifically looking at lament around racial reconciliation. But he gives these kind of four steps that I think are really helpful and I just want to kind of process these out a, a bit together. So hopefully this will be helpful um, as, we, as we kind of consider um, the, the Psalms role, Psalm 13, and just the Psalms role in general around lament. So here are the four things that we're going to look at, the four steps when it comes to lament. Uh, the first step is turning to, uh, turning to God in prayer. The, the second um, step is bringing our complaints before God. The third step is asking boldly. And then, uh, and then the fourth uh, step is choosing to trust or to praise. So it's bringing, um, coming to God in prayer, bringing our complaints before God, asking boldly, and choosing to trust. Okay, let's, let's walk through uh, these four things because I think, um, I think they'll, they'll be helpful. Uh, the, the reality is when, when many of us experience difficulty in our life, uh, many times what we want to do, some of us at least in the room, what we want to do is go silent before God. And so I've been in plenty of interactions with people and meetings with people where they're experiencing grief and difficulty. And I've heard this statement actually a lot where where they basically say to me, I can't even pray. Like I don't even, I don't even want to pray. Like I just, I just, just go silent before God. Like like things aren't aligning, life's not going the way that I want to go. And, and so I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go quiet. Like that, that's one, that's one approach that when you face the hardship of life and when it comes to your relationship with God, um, you just, you just go silent. 
I'm just like, I'm just not going to even talk to him. I'm not going to deal with it. On, on the other end of the spectrum, so that's kind of one kind of approach you can take as we think about uh, unhealthy approaches, right? I'm not saying that's the approach. Uh, the other end of the spectrum when it comes to unhealthy approaches, this is the one that I tend to lean towards, is that when we experience difficulty and suffering and hardship, your posture is to what? It's to push harder. It's to grind more. It's to, to move forward. It's like, okay, I need to it spend more energy. I need to, to work harder. I need to, like, I, I'm, I'm not going to recognize kind of all this that's going on around me. I, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to think harder. I'm going to work harder. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, like, w- what I've got in front of me to, to kind of press forward. And so, not, so you're not stopping. You're not embracing. You're not recognizing. You're just saying, I'm, I'm, okay, I need to work. Uh, I need to work a bit harder. Now, in, in some ways, this, this kind of idea um, of, of working harder, um, in, in some ways, can be great, right? So, what kind of individual do you want planting a church in the middle of a global pandemic? You want me, right? Like, you just want someone who's a, a, almost oblivious to the just sheer heart, like, that's unreasonable. Like, that's what you, that's what you want. You want... Uh, you want a personality, a guy or girl that's just like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna press. Like I'm just gonna press for it. It's like we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I got to understand that, you know, whatever. And I'm just gonna keep moving forward. That that's a helpful, like it's it's a that's a pretty good personality. Like my personality during COVID was actually working pretty well. Like it was it was like let's let's just keep moving forward. It's like yeah, but all this stuff is going. To, okay, let's go. Right. This is great. And in, in in some ways that works well. Now, the same thing that made me, um, in, in some ways, now that'll catch up to you, um, has caught up to me. Uh, that strength in leading our church is good. That, that same strength there is actually super destructive when it comes to my relationship with my wife. It, it, it's really actually destructive when it comes to a relationship with my daughter. Because if I don't understand how to lament, and again, we'll, we're talking through that, what all that looks like. But, it, but if I, my, my wife or my daughter is experiencing like grief and hardship and, and difficulty, or, or my five-year-old son, it's a very limited level of grief. But um, if, if I just try and push forward, um, it actually crushes the relational intimacy that would exist there, right? And, and so we have to watch our, we have to kind of watch ourselves. We have to watch our natural kind of disposition. It, it actually takes a tremendous amount of faith to lament properly. I, I don't, it doesn't take much work to go silent, and it doesn't take much work to really to keep pushing forward. It actually takes a ton of work to be honest before God with your grief with your uncertainty, and with your anger. It takes faith to lament, to do that. It, it's, not, um, it's not good. It's not brave to go silent. It's not brave to push forward. I, I get it. I under, understand it. N.T. Wright, um, he says it this way. Uh, he, he says, something that said of, of, of lamenting in our Christian walk, it says, in fact, it is, it is a part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain and to lament instead of explaining. As the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in our self-isolation, small shrines where the presence and the healing love of God can dwell. So it's not explaining your, your grief away, your sadness away, your um, difficulty away. It's actually just lamenting these things. It's embracing these things. God, God is our Father act, actually like wants us in vulnerability before him. Like, like imagine for a second, I just mentioned my daughter. Imagine my daughter comes to me. She's 11, so she's going into sixth grade, so yeah. Um, so imagine she came to me and said, hey, I've kind of got this difficult, this would never happen, but I've um, got this difficulty with these other girls, and so they're saying this, or they're doing this, or that's whatever, you know, kind of situation, and, and she's coming to me with her grief and uncertainty and, and this type of things, and, and, she, and I'm just like, baby, can't you see how busy I am? 
Like, don't you understand? Like, what, why are you talking to me in this moment? Like, where's your mom? You know, where's a, like, go Google, access Alexa. Like, you know, like, why are you, like, what, like, think about the, the like, detrimental effect of that moment. What, what happens when, when my daughter comes to me and, and it says, hey, I've got this struggle and things are going on. And, and like, that, that's actually a moment that, that my wife and I welcome. Because in those moments, we're getting what? We're actually seeing, like, the inner life of our daughter in that moment. We're, we're pressing, because we want to see, okay, what is it that you're struggling with? What is it that you're dealing with? Where are your insecurities? Like, where are the questions that you have? Like, what's kind of being raised to the surface as you're navigating this particular part of your life? Like, as a parent, we're actually welcoming that space. I'm actually seeing her, in, in a lot of ways, with more clear eyes than I do when things are going well. So God the Father is the same way. He's like, bring me your heart. Bring me your struggles. I, I want to receive those things. Th- think about um, when you're in, in a conversation, with, when things are going wrong, and, and you're in a conversation with a, a, friend, a, a close friend or maybe a spouse or a parent or whatever. Um, th- that relational dynamic that you have in that moment, like you're not watching your words. Like, you're not trying to be careful with your words, with those that you're closest with. You're just, you're, you're just like, you're almost just throwing up and, like, word vomit, right, in front of them. You're like, I don't understand, and, and I'm, you're, you're not giving a bunch of, you know, preferences here and there. You're not giving a, you're just kind of saying, like, this is where I'm at. That, that relational intimacy that you have with that person is an enabling that type of closeness. This is, this is what it's, this is what it's doing. We're okay. Um. That relationship's enabling that, right? Th- this is the relational dynamic that we have with God the Father. To say, like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to bring it before you. I'm, I'm going I'm to bring it ahead of you. Psalm uh, 77, listen, l- look at this kind of um, vulnerability uh, that the, re- the relationship with the psalmist has with God. Psalm 77, this is 1 through 3. It says, I cried out loud to God, out loud to God, and he will hear me. I sought the Lord, so not, I didn't run from the Lord. He said, I sought the Lord in the day of trouble, and my hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refuse to be comforted. I think of God, and I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. I mean, look at that. It's, it, he's like, my hands are continually lifted up. Um, I refuse to be comforted. I, I groan. There's this real kind of recognition of the circumstances around them. He, here's our problem. Um, our problem is we tend to want to medicate our pain instead of recognizing our pain. We, we've been taught and formed to medicate the pain that we feel. And it, it could work for a bit until it doesn't, until it blows up. But, but we want to medicate it, right? We want to we wanna buy stuff. We want to medicate it with drinking. We want to medicate it with sex. We want to um, medicate it with binge watching TV all day. This is, what we've been, this is what we've been taught to do, to not embrace our pain, not recognize our pain, not recognize the grief, not, not like, in a lot of ways, our, our kind of culture doesn't necessarily form that within us. We've been taught just to kind of do this or, or, or do that. It's why in COVID, alcohol sales blew up. Like, alcohol sales were out the roof. That is not because people were having cocktail parties, right? Because people didn't know what to do with their pain. They didn't know what to do with the isolation that they were feeling, the uncertainty that they were feeling. So they were trying to medicate. They weren't bringing these things before God. They were trying to press these things down, not deal with these things. So the first thing is, is coming to God in conversation and prayer. Here's the second thing. Uh, the second thing is bringing our complaints to God. So, um, so step one, right? So these are connected in some ways and they're not connected in other ways. So what I don't want you to hear when I say come to God in conversation or come to God in prayer when you're experiencing this difficulty, what I'm not saying is you come to him and, and just your response is, my God, I trust you. You're just a faithful father. You're a good, good father, right? Like that's just, you're kind of, that's not, I'm not saying that the response when we experience this is just simply saying, God, I believe the Bible. Uh, I believe you're good and I have faith. That's not lamenting. That, that's a part. We'll get to it a little bit later. 
But that, that's not the biblical lamenting that, that we see. Like the, the biblical lamenting, and, and I think this is what it means to be a mature and healthy uh, follower of Jesus. Biblical lamenting is, is actually bringing your complaints before God. It, it, it's, it's saying to him, hey, I, I'm, I've got some issues here. I got some things going on, and and I'm I'm I, this, I can't make sense of this situation, this circumstance, this feeling that I'm having. The circumstance aren't matching the character that I know that you have. So I need I bring this before you. I got this thing I can't I can't move past the barrier. I'm I'm bringing this before you. I got some complaints I need to. Um, lay out before you L- all lamenting it lamenting at its core is just a recognition that life isn't as it should be that it's not as it should be that we live in a broken space we live in a broken world in a moment we shouldn't be surprised by lamenting we, we should see it and go yes this is evidence that we live in a broken world that there's hardship and there, there's difficulty some of you this morning, and I, I just want to say this, and I, I know it's true because I talk to people um, about it. Some of you this morning just need to hear that it's okay to recognize your negative emotions before God. Some of you have been taught, whether explicitly through family formation or, or through social groups or, or through whatever, or implicitly, it's just been implied that you cannot be honest with how you feel. And that is not true. And so some of you this morning just need to to, uh, receive the permission to be able to be frustrated with God, to be angry in your kind of current situation. Like that's an okay thing. You have the permission to do that. God's not afraid of that. God's not fearful of that. It's actually what we see in the Bible, that it's appropriate to be, to be sad or disappointed with God. Look, Psalm 13, 1 through 3, says, How long, Lord? This is David. It says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me and agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? Consider me and answer, Lord my God, restore brightness to my eyes or otherwise I will sleep in death. It it sounds like David's pretty comfortable being honest with God about how he feels. I don't know if I'm reading between the lines here, but it feels a bit like he's not holding back. He knows the heart of God. He understands it. He knows that God welcomes it. Um. I think one of the reasons lamenting is so crucial um, to our Christian discipleship, to to our kind of faith community, it's one of the reasons why we need to talk about it collectively. Um, One of the reasons it's so important is because when we experience difficulty and hardship, if if we don't figure out how to transfer that difficulty or, or that sadness and uncertainty, if we don't figure out how to transform that, uh, we'll transfer it. Like, like if, you, if we don't deal with um, the uncertainty that we feel, um, the sadness that we feel, and the grief that we feel in moments with God, what that turns into eventually is bitterness and anger. And that bitterness and anger then gets, it could, because it's not been transformed, it gets transferred. Some of you have been on the other end of that before. You've been on the other end of, of, of a failure to lament in a healthy way within the life of someone. And, and you've received that, right? Or, or perhaps you've done that before. And, and we can't live in healthy community with one another. That's why, it doesn't, that's why it doesn't help you or a community of other followers to just say, I'm going to keep this in to myself. You, you actually can't keep it into yourself. It begins to leak out in harmful ways, in destructive ways when we don't recognize how to um, lament. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, there's a, a very strong, in, in Scripture, there's a very strong call to lament in community. 
with one another. To, 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 to like actually recognize. So, so it's not so much the experiencing the difficulty together that creates the binding. It's the acknowledgement and the lamenting together that does the binding. Right? You can experience hardship um, collectively together and not actually talk about it, not actually deal with it, not, not, not do the work of lamenting. It's a whole other thing to go, hey, I, we collectively see this thing um, in front of us and, and out, of our, out of our hurt, out of our pain, out of our uncertainty right now, we're going to actually do something about it. It's a strong biblical principle to say lamenting together brings about change. It brings about uh, a type of, of movement. Paul, sounding very similar to uh, Solomon, this is Romans 12, 15. Um, Paul's instructions were what? He said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, some of you have, and, and I get it because it's, 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 it's hard for me, um, for some of us, we, we struggle to rejoice when people rejoice. And even more so, we struggle to weep when people weep. And sometimes the best thing that you can do when someone's in a process of lamenting is just sitting with them. Not trying to give a bunch of answers, not talk about how, you know, this is for God's glory and your goodness or whatever. Like, all, all those are help. I think there's a time and a place for those types of things. But, like, there are just moments where it's just sitting. And it's just, we, if you've ever had anyone weep with you, if you've ever had anyone so moved by the grief and the sadness that you're experiencing, it's an incredibly powerful moment. It, it, it's more powerful than any words that could have ever came out of their mouth. So there's a biblical call to lament together, to embrace these types of things. Okay, so it's, it's coming to God in prayer. It's bringing our complaints before God, being honest before God. Thirdly, it's asking boldly. Um, is asking boldly. He, here's what I've learned in my life. There have been certain circumstances and situations in my life where these circumstances don't align with the character of God. And I'm going, I know your character. I recognize your promises to me. And these circumstances are not aligning to that. Just, they're just not straight up. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of going like I can't make these make sense. Psalm 13, uh, 3 through 4 uh, David says, consider me and answer me, Lord my God. Restore, look at him, he says, restore brightness to my eyes, or otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have triumphed over him, and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. We, good, healthy, mature Christian formation in the way of Jesus is is just bluntly asking God for things not trying to sugarcoat it not trying to get around it if your will be done kind of situation like just just God this is this is where I'm at um, we're, do, we're doing a we're going to do a whole series on prayer later in the fall and so I, I don't want to get into all of the aspects of this but there have been multiple times in my life where I just invoke a type of Matthew 6 prayer. So Matthew 6, um, as part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I, th I think the greatest collection of teachings that ever exist. So this is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in Matthew 6, Jesus says, in, in his instruction, he, he basically says, I'll paraphrase, um, you should, don't be anxious about things. Look at the, the birds of the sky. Right? They, know, they neither store nor read they don't, they don't put their stuff in in barns and they're taking they're taken care of right look at the lilies of the field they're they're more beautiful than than solomon something i don't know what it was uh solomon and all of his splendor right wasn't adorned like these i know we're all thinking that when we look at the fields of the, the fields um look look at him solomon couldn't even match this the beauty of that couldn't match it. look at him look at him out there jesus is going like look at him out there and, and he says, okay, so if God cares for the birds and God clothes the, the lilies of the field, like, won't my father take care of you? So, so seek first. He, he, um, he ends it. He says, um, so don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for the Gentiles. This is Matthew six thirty two. For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that we provided for you. 
Uh, Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, right? And so there are all kinds of periods in my life, different circumstances, where I'm doing Matthew 6 prayers, and I'm going, all right, God, you said in Matthew chapter 6 that I shouldn't uh, worry or have anxiety or or that you're going to take care of me, and I shouldn't worry about clothing or food, and look at the birds, and look at the lilies of the field, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I need. I'm invoking Matthew 6 prayers. Like, I'm just putting before him. I'm just bluntly just saying it. Like, I'm not trying to get around it. I'm, I'm just saying, you've said in Matthew 6, you care about me. So I'm, I'm just going to be straightforward with what I need. What's going on? You said, if you pray in secret, the Father who sees in secret will reward you. You, you say, when you fast, to clean your face. Don't let anyone see that you're fasting. Clean your face, and your Father who sees you fasting in secret will reward you. I'm, I'm laying it out before you. Laying it before you. Now, two things. I theologically um, believe there is merit in the Scripture to do that. And I from an experimental standpoint, from a very pragmatic standpoint, have experienced God's provision in my life that is boiled out of a a type of blunt prayer life with God. Now, I'm not, I don't want to get into all of it. Gosh, man, that's why I can't go down these trails. Um, We're going to have a sermon series on prayer. It's going to be so good. Um, It's not controlling God. It's bluntly asking him what I need. It's evoking the scriptures. And, and so we, we've got to learn. This is, this is what David does. Um, this is what David does in Psalm 13. He just says, consider me, answer me, restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy is saying these things. My foes are going to rejoice. I need you to consider, not just consider, I need you to answer me. And biblical lamenting is bringing forward your prayers before God and your requests before God, just just bluntly asking him and bringing them forward. He's not fearful. He's not scared of that. All right, fourth thing, final thing here, um, and then we'll be done. So firstly, it's it's drawing near to God um, in prayer. It takes faith to lament. The second thing is uh, bringing our complaints before God. The third thing is um, being blunt before uh, God in, in what we need, bluntly asking. And number four, it's choosing to trust or praise. Here's the thing. Um, renewed confidence in God's trustworthiness is the destination of all laments. Renewed confidence in the trustworthiness of God is the destination of all biblical laments. Th- this, is where we're, this is where we're moving to. It's, it's again, renewed confidence um, in God. L- laments help us through suffering, right? They help us to direct our hearts to make a choice often daily, often daily to trust in God's promises that are many times hidden behind the pain. Psalm 13, look how, he, look how David ends here, Psalm 13, 5 and 6. He says, but, so he, he's been laying out all these things, and he says, but I've trusted in your faithful love. Okay, but, conjunction, that beautiful conjunction. He says, but, I have trusted in your faithful love My heart will rejoice in your deliverance, and I will sing to the Lord. Why? Because he has treated me generously. I'll trust in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice. The Psalms, I want you to hear this. The Psalms are not simply Hebrew poems about how people used to communicate with God. They are evidence that God is both interested in our needs and invites our questions. Let me say it again and say it in a different way. We don't read the Psalms and go, man, that's really cool that people related to God that way. That's so awesome that God had a type of like relational dynamic and capacity with these kind of people that I'm reading about in the Bible. That's really cool that, that David and God kind of had that relational intimacy and, and, and they could do that. Um, it, it's not just about how people used to communicate with God. It's evidence to the fact that God welcomes our questions and concerns. It's a template for us to say, ba- based on the, 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 the biblical authors here, 
who seem to be very comfortable with just laying all of this out. They don't have all the answers, but they got tons of pain and problems. And they're just laying it out before you. Based on that, here it is, God. Here's what I got. I need you to do something with it. I need your help in dealing with this. Now, Jesus uh, understood this better than anyone. Um, Jesus was in perfect union with God the Father, and yet still saw the practice of lamenting as something to be embraced. Uh, John eleven thirty three 33 and 39, we talked about this, uh, this passage and this scene a couple of weeks ago in one of our series, but um, Jesus is, is approaching the scene of his friend Lazarus' funeral, and uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus have this really tight relationship, this tight kind of friendship. And so John 11, 33 and 39, just look at this interaction really, really briefly. It says when Jesus, talking about Mary, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews had come with her crying, it, look what it says in 33. It says he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Okay, so again, perfect union with the Father. He, know, he actually knows where this is going, where this particular scene is leading to. And it says he's troubled in his spirit. Verse 34. Uh, where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. So then verse 35, Jesus comes to the tomb. He, he sees, um, the. so they've hired, we've talked about it, but they've hired professional lamenters. And so there are people whose job is to lament. So when the lamenting goes down in this culture, when the lamenting goes, like when people begin to, goes down, the paid lamenters level up, right? This is their job. This is their moment. And so Jesus is approaching the tomb. He's hearing the laments. He's seeing kind of everyone experiencing the moment that they're experiencing. And then verse 35, it says what? It says, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in Scripture, right? If you're in a memory verse challenge, go John eleven thirty-five 35 immediately. It says, Jesus wept. Verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes have also kept this man from dying? Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. There was a cave, and he said, move the, the stone away. So Jesus gets here to Lazarus' funeral, and, and he tells us a lot. It, it tells us a lot about what he doesn't do. Jesus doesn't get to the tomb and go, do you guys lack this type of faith? Look, this is crazy. Have you not seen me? feed 5,000 people? Have you not seen me um, heal the blind and, and heal the lame? Have you not seen me give people back their ability to walk? Have, like, have you guys, do you have such little faith? Like, do you, I, this is un, Jesus is like, this is unbelievable to me that you, you think this is going to stop me? Is that what Jesus does? Jesus knows that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he does what? He enters into the lamenting with them. He enters into the grief. He allows his spirit to be troubled inside of him. He laments. He enters in. This is happening. Now, John 11, same passage of Scripture, same scene where Jesus says what? This is, this is actually why we can trust God with our lamenting. This statement right here is actually why we can trust God with our lamenting. Jesus says what? He says, I I am the resurrection and the life. And if you say yes to me, you will never actually die. You'll live forever. Live forever. The, the resurrection of Jesus is the evidence that God can be trusted with your pain. It's the evidence that he understands it. It's the evidence that he understands sadness and disappointment it, it, it is that the crucifixion and the resurrection is both the evidence for the fact that he understands it and it's proof of the fact that we can take it to him. And so we don't have to be a people. Listen, let's embrace our grief. Let's embrace our sadness. Let's embrace the certainty. But let's be sure in the midst of the embracing of the sadness and the grief to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's take some time, I, just a little bit of response time. We'll, we'll step into the bread and cup in a moment, but maybe you're here and you're, you've been walking through a season, and, and I don't know, maybe your personality is like mine, and when things get tough or things get hard, things get uncertain, you just work more. You level up, you're, you're picking up a shift here, or you're doing more hours here, and, and you, because 
you just don't want to, you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to face it. And so maybe you're here this morning, and for you, you just need to, to say to God this morning, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. Maybe you're here and you've gone quiet with him. And you just need to say to him, God, I, this is what I got. I got some stuff, and I need to bring it to you. Some stuff I need to ask of you. Maybe you just need to have that conversation with him this morning. Maybe you're here and you've got some friendships, relationships that have been lamenting, and you, you've just refused to weep with those who weep. Maybe you need to own that before God this morning. Let's take a little bit of time, just a time of response, and then I'll, I'll have us to stand, and we'll take the bread and cup together. So let's do just a few